patients and patient advocate outreach at the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, CERN. And I'd like to welcome you to this webinar uh, discussing some of the changes that are taking place in the way we operate. Um, as you know, the, when the voters approved Proposition 14 last year, it gave us an extra $5.5 billion and an incredible opportunity to continue to the work that we started back in 2004. Um, but there are some changes in the way we're operating. We're gonna be updating some things and introducing some new ideas. Uh, some of those we're still discussing and trying to figure out exactly how they operate. But to talk about some of the things we do know, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Gil Zambrano, and he is a Vice President for Portfolio Development and review. Um, so Gil, after we've had a presentation from Gil outlining some of the changes, we'll be happy to take some of your questions and you can post those in the Q&A section at the, at the bottom of your screen. Um, we may not be able to get to all of those questions today, but if we can't get to them today, we'll certainly get to them and respond through our blog at, at a later date. I would also like to, to tell everyone that we're gonna be recording this because obviously there are many researchers and people involved who are interested in this, who won't be able to watch it today. So we're gonna record it and post it on our YouTube channel and people will be able to uh, see that at a later date. And so with that, Gil, take it away. Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone, good afternoon. Um, so we're, we're thrilled uh, to be here and to be able to present um, the relaunch of new programs that uh, will get us started under Prop 14. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, go through a slide presentation that's gonna focus on highlighting uh, our programs as we have, um, as we intend to uh, launch for the beginning of this year. So we're looking at this as a, a relaunch of existing programs. So um, many of you might be familiar with our discovery, translational and clinical programs that are largely uh, aligned with pipeline therapy development. And so we are bringing those programs back uh, simply because those uh, are already uh, largely well-structured and uh, easy for us to re-implement. However, uh, over the course of the last couple of years, uh, limits on the available budget prevented us from having these programs open and available. Uh, so now we're gonna move forward with those as a, uh, as a starting place uh, from which we will then also begin to expand uh, into other programs probably on, on both ends of the spectrum, some more uh, basic discovery, um, as well as uh, more clinical uh, programs, and then other educational and infrastructure programs uh, are yet to come. So for now, we're gonna focus on, on these three. Our discovery program, uh, which is really largely our DIST two program, is focused on uh, developing therapeutic candidates uh, which can be a, a, a therapeutic, a diagnostic device, uh, or even a tool. The translational program takes candidates and allows them to advance to a pre-IND meeting or regulatory meeting uh, with the FDA to uh, start the process of clinical development of those. And then, our clinical program supports uh, IND enabling work as well as clinical trials. So those are the programs that uh, I will focus on in terms of uh, our, our relaunch. And uh, just to say that the board gave approval in December for us to relaunch these programs under Prop 14. So for those that may already be familiar with some of these uh, programs, let me just tell you uh, some of the changes that have happened um, with them uh, and some of the additions that were made. So there is an uh, added requirement for all applicants to provide a data sharing plan uh, and an allowance to include related costs in the budget. And so here we are uh, uh, trying to set an expectation uh, for awardees to try to develop a data sharing plan that is presented in the application and executed throughout the course of uh, the award in order to allow um, the, the sharing and collaboration uh, through the uh, work that we support. 
uh, our goal is to try to make the most of the work that we fund, and we hope that uh, investigators will collaborate uh, in order to um, help identify um, common challenges and or identify and utilize data uh, in ways that uh, will enhance and uh, allow you to develop uh, better proposals in the future. Um, so that is one element that was added. Um, we removed the requirement that deemed gene therapy projects a vital research opportunity. So this was a sort of a technicality um, in, in the process. So the gene therapy allowance is not really changing. Uh, we have a specific definition for how gene therapy projects can come in. Uh, they just no longer require this vital research opportunity uh, assessment uh, in order to qualify. So uh, we have sort of expanded the scope of CIRM into gene therapy a bit, and so that'll be reflected in these program announcements. We have also added a review criterion for uh, the review panel to assess uh, these projects, as well as our board, uh, based on applicant statements and plans to address needs of underserved communities. So this is another element that we feel is important, that our board feels is very important in terms of ensuring that the research we fund is gonna be available ultimately to uh, all of the different and diverse communities within California. So that's just an example of some of those. And then we have and are developing a process for addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion within the assessment of the applications. So one of them, as I mentioned, was that review criterion, which will look at uh, the scientific elements, such as if it's a clinical uh, trial proposal, enrollment and outreach plans, uh, or the incorporation of diversity into the research sign design, excuse me, um, and that will be part of the score and critique. Uh, in addition, we are also uh, asking applicants to incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion more broadly within their project. And so they may do so through um, the composition of the team uh, by uh, doing outreach and bringing in perspectives from patients and diverse communities into the uh, thought process and design of their projects. Um, so here are some just uh, brief uh, overview of, of specific changes that went into the programs. Um, and so we'll start with the DISC-2. So again, this is uh, discovery awards to identify a candidate therapeutic medical device diagnostic or tool. And so most of the changes here were really to bring them back up in terms of the uh, duration and award amounts that we had a couple of years ago, those uh, were reduced given budget limitations but have now been restored uh, for direct project costs of up to 900,000 for therapeutic candidates and 500,000 for a diagnostic device or a tool. The award duration for DISC-2s are uh, 24 months and the PI percent effort requirement uh, is 20%. Uh, for all our projects, we also have a date in which we uh, expect upon approval for the projects to get started with uh, activities. And so for DISC-2, that has now been updated to, to 60 days, meaning that we really wanna have the contracting uh, after approval go as quickly as possible so that um, we can uh, launch those programs. Uh, same with our uh, translational program. So we have uh, four flavors of the translational program. The TRAN-1 is focused on therapeutics, uh, TRAN-2 and 3 on diagnostics and devices, and TRAN-4 on tools. And so um, these carry forward any candidates that are identified from the previous round, or if you're coming in with an already uh, identified candidate, you can enter into one of these. Um, there were not many changes that were made to this specific announcement simply because uh, it had not been offered for a couple of years, but we did update the uh, 
approval uh, to launch time to 60 days as we did with the discovery. So some changes to the clinical program. The clinical program uh, has three flavors. The CLIN1 is in support of IND enabling activities. The CLIN2 will support clinical trials. And the CLIN3 is to support um, registration of an existing CLIN2 award. So that is more of a uh, supplement type of award that allows uh, a clinical trial to more quickly advance towards approval. So most of the changes here are with the CLIN2, which supports clinical trials. We restored uh, award amounts, and those vary depending on whether it's a phase one, phase two, or phase three, and whether uh, it is from a for-profit or a non-profit institution. And so there is a table that shows those, but essentially those have been restored uh, to what we had um, you know, about two years ago. The award duration uh, is now a maximum of four years for a CLIN II. Uh, the project initiation was restored to 45 days within approval, so we want those to also get started very quickly. And then we uh, updated the percent effort requirement for project managers to 50%. And then also we went through the uh, program announcement, made some clarifications. Um, we noticed that minimally manipulated bone marrow cord blood or unmodified HSCs uh, are eligible for phase two and phase three, but that wasn't clear in the uh, program announcement. So we have clarified that language. And lastly, it's, it's uh, really important to take a look at those program announcements because they detail all of the uh, requirements in, in terms of eligibility. It outlines our process for review. Uh, and it also talks a little bit about some of the post-award expectations and recommendations. And so those are available on our uh, public website under funding opportunities. So uh, you can look under the respective areas of DISC, TRAN, or CLIN, and those are the ones that are currently available. And then uh, through those documents, you can also, or independent of those, access our application materials online um, at the um, link shown here, grants.cerm.ca.gov. So in order to apply, you need to set up a login uh, and uh, once you do, then you will have access to all the open programs and uh, you can look at the application materials. Uh, there are uh, proposal uh, downloads that uh, are available within the application that'll detail the page limitations, the different sections that are available uh, and so on. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And so with that, Kevin, I'll uh, turn it back to you and, and happy to address any questions that folks may have. Great, thanks Gil. Um, so I know there are lots of questions that you probably have. So again, if you type them into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen, we'll be able to uh, answer them. I have to say in advance that there are some issues that uh, you may be interested in knowing that we haven't quite worked out yet. That we're still really beginning to kind of um, explore what we can do with the extra $5.5 billion that Prop 14 has given us. There are lots of things we want to do. We're just trying to see out what the best way of doing that is and also to roll it out in a way that makes sense. We have a really small review team at the moment. We're hoping to expand that. Um, but right now they're working on uh, developing the most uh, immediate uh, programs. And so with that, um, let me ask the first question, which was from Randall Berg, who's the CAO with the Stem Cell Research uh, Center. And he asks, what's the projected timeline for release of the shared research laboratory, Alpha Stem Cell Clinic and Training Grant RFAs, and when are the anticipated submission due dates? So that, that's a great question. There's a lot of different programs that are outlined under Prop 14, and those are gonna become the subject of, um, of board discussion beginning particularly uh, at a, a late January uh, board meeting. 
but it will be ongoing uh, as we develop a strategic plan over the next six months. And, and hopefully uh, we hope that we will be able to launch uh, mid-year. And so uh, the exact dates and, and timing for when these will be issued is not yet known, uh, but certainly part of that active discussion. Great, thank you. Um, one of the questions in Q&A is, uh, can you elaborate on the difference between TRAN1 and CLIN1? Thanks, and that's from Wan Chen. Sure, uh, that's a great question. So for TRAN1, so this is for the development of a, of a therapeutic, the goal of, of our translational program is to conduct activities that will get you to a pre-IND meeting uh, with the FDA. Um, so uh, all activities that um, uh, will allow you to put together that uh, package and hold that meeting to give you advice on what then the following set of activities will be, uh, which would then be funded under CLIN1. CLIN1 is IND enabling activity. So that will allow you then to have uh, um, and file a IND with the FDA. And so the, the course of a TRAN-1 is um, something that may take you up to 24 months uh, and a CLIN-1 uh, about 18 months uh, to get you to the place where you can then initiate a clinical trial. Great, thank you, Gil. Um, Jared Roach has a question, which is, will there be any special emphasis or consideration of COVID-19 research? And you remember that the board, our board um, issued $5 million in emergency funding for COVID-19 last year, which, and that was spent quite quickly because the demand was so great. We funded 17 different programs, including three clinical trials. And uh, so Gil, would you, do you want to answer uh, Jared's question? Sure, sure. Hi, Jared. Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, we, we do plan to continue to uh, fund COVID-19 research to the extent that we can. We are not specifically uh, calling it out in these program announcements, uh, but certainly uh, if, if they qualify, we will accept applications in that arena. Great. Um, Nikita Palmer is asking, uh, is the Bridges program going to be revived? So the Bridges program is is still alive and exists. And so uh, our discussion is going to be about, um, you know, how to uh, extend it and how to um, uh, m maybe uh, tweak it uh, to continue to improve upon it. And so stay tuned because that will probably be one of the first things that we address given that that is an ongoing program that we want to continue to support. And Ellen Fung has a kind of a similar question, which is, will you continue to offer training grants? So the simple answer is, is yes. And, and we, we plan to develop uh, training in, in a variety of ways. And so again, that's gonna be uh, part of the board discussion, but I anticipate it's gonna be offered in, in a, a broad way uh, at different levels. So much as we do the high school program for Spark and Bridges for uh, undergraduates, we will um, be coming back to grad students, postdocs, clinical fellows, and so on as well. Great. Um, I'd also like to read something now from uh, Dr. Kelly Shepard, who heads our, our Bridges program and, and one of our, our senior science officers. Um, we asked her about this earlier and, and Kelly writes, Training at all levels is an important uh, issue for, uh, for CIRM, creating and maintaining a viable, diverse workforce in the regenerative medicine community. Proposition 14 prioritizes training and CIRM will continue to support education and training programs beyond 2020. So look for discussions with our board in early 2021 that will begin laying the groundwork for our educational strategy, a process that will continue as CIRM develops a new strategic plan with guidance from our board. So I hope that helps answer some of the questions. Um, Dr. Rosa Bacchetta has another one, which is, does the CLIN2 um, area cover the trials correlative studies? And does it also allow the inclusion of an outside California center or outside US center? Thank you. 
Sure, uh, great question. So it, it, it can cover correlative studies. Um, so as long as they are all aligned with uh, the goal of completing a, a clinical trial, uh, I think in general that should be fine. The inclusion of an outside uh, California center, uh, yes, is certainly allowed. Um, so you, you may have, for example, a clinical trial. If you're, if you're a California organization, you have the ability to have clinical sites both within California and outside of California and get uh, full support for those. Great. Um, Bo Harmon asks uh, for clarification on using uh, minimally manipulated bone marrow. Is it correct that adipose stromal vascular fraction is also acceptable? Uh, so yes. So I, I, I think what becomes the question is, whether the uh, cells that you are working with or the fraction that you isolate contain stem or progenitor cells. And as long as they do, they would generally be eligible. Um, <clears throat> and Bo follows up with, uh, are submission dates and review timelines listed on the new program announcements? Um, so the, uh, su the submission dates and timelines are uh, posted with the application material. So on the first page, when you access the application, you will see the, the deadline. So I can just tell you uh, that for the clinical program, we have a, a, a recurring cycle uh, every month. So it is the last business day of every month. You will have a deadline for the clinical program. Uh, starting this month. And then for um, the TRAN program, we have a deadline February 18th. And for the DISC-2 program, it's March 18th. Great. Uh, John Brock asks, will there be an emphasis on funding treatments for neurological disorders? So great question. There is a, uh, a specific call out for uh, neurological or, or disorders of the brain uh, in Prop 14. And so how we structure and uh, create an emphasis within that uh, arena is uh, part of the discussion that we will be having. So certainly we have always been open uh, to Nero projects and will continue under these existing program announcements, but you should anticipate um, some uh, additional opportunities uh, that will develop in this area. Great. Um, Mayor Cassetti says, with regards to gene therapy, can you comment on how AAV gene therapies will be evaluated? Um, so AAV is uh, obviously the, the very common form of uh, or mechanism for gene therapy, probably uh, most of what we are seeing uh, at the moment. Um, so that is a, an, an active area uh, that we uh, look at and accept. So um, certainly if you have a proposal with AAB um, uh, vectors, uh, feel free to look at our program announcements. Great. Um, Suzanne Bolson was asking, will DISC-1 awards become available again? That's the Inception Awards. Correct. So Inception is not available right now. Uh, we are trying to find a, um, a, a different approach, a way to enhance those. And so some flavor of the DISC one will uh, come back at some point, but it is not part of this initial um, cohort of opportunities that we're offering at the moment. Great. Um, Dr. Eduardo Marban uh, uh, says, my understanding is that CLIN1 will be open with application deadlines at the end of each month. What about TRAN1? Is that rolling or solely RFA driven? And if the latter, when is the anticipated first deadline and how often will it recur? Right, so I, I, I just mentioned those deadlines, but just to, to add, um, I think just so you know, the expectation is that all of these core programs are going to be recurring. So the clinical program is uh, at the end of every month, but we expect that as we get going, the translational program will be offered three times per year at regular cycles and that the DISC-2 will be offered twice a year at regular cycles. 
um, and that will hopefully leave us room for the addition of other core programs as we begin to add those into the uh, mix. Great. Other, and then Aaron Sharma asks, are there um, early career scientist development grants planned as was the case in years past? So at the moment there are not, uh, but again, a, a uh, topic for discussion as we move forward with our strategic planning. Great. Um, Alexa Poole asks, will cancer stem cell qualify for any of the current grants? So yes, they, they do. Uh, so cancer stem cells are uh, part of the eligibility criteria. Um, as long as you uh, can show that the cancer stem cell is a cancer stem cell in you know, one way or another, uh, it should qualify. So I encourage you to take a look at the eligibility uh, criteria within the program announcements uh, for, for the details on that. And if you end up having questions, I, I think this is just also an important note um, about whether a project qualifies. The program announcement will direct you to, uh, depending on which one you're looking at, either the therapeutics team or to our uh, discovery and translation teams who will be very happy to uh, address questions about um, candidate eligibility and about whether your project might be a good fit for the announcement that you're looking at. Just to ensure that um, if you're going to put the time uh, to filling out an application uh, that it, it's going to be the, the, the best uh, fit for your project. Um, we got some questions before the, the uh, broadcast began. Um, this is from some of the faculty at USC saying, will CERM support research involving animal models versus being restricted only to studies using human cells? Most promising stem cell treatments rely on discovery and preclinical research in animal models, ranging from zebrafish to mouse to larger mammalians. Um, without investment in this space, new ideas will run dry. So we are certainly uh, thinking about how to expand our, our early basic and discovery uh, funding opportunities uh, to capture many of that uh, work. So currently the DIS2 program is focused on, on candidate discovery uh, in which animal models are used, but in the context of uh, developing a proof of concept. But for um, the early basic discovery, uh, we are hoping and planning on um, offering uh, some uh, opportunities in that arena as well. And um, following up from that from USC, will new funding be available for infrastructure? In Prop 71, considerable funds were dedicated to creating new research buildings and centers for discovery research yet more translationally focused research buildings are still lacking. Could Prop 14 provide infrastructure funds for clinically centered implementation of stem cell trials? Right, so we, we don't know yet. Um, uh, that again falls into the arena of, of our strategic planning and board discussion. And so uh, just stay tuned as we uh, develop these plans and, and figure out uh, exactly where infrastructure funding will fall. Um, Martin Kampman asks, will the DISC-2 program fund research that uses stem cell technology to discover therapeutics, even if the therapeutics themselves are not stem cells, but small molecules? Yes, no, that's a good question. So yes, you can use within the DISC-2 program stem cell technology, for example, to do uh, small molecule screens or um, use it as a tool in any way to discover a therapeutic. Now, whether in turn that therapeutic becomes uh, eligible for uh, ongoing support depends on whether it meets the uh, stem cell or gene therapy eligibility criteria. Great. I'm um, seeing a lot of familiar names on the, on the Q&A today. One of them is Evan <clears throat> Snyder, who's asking, are there plans to reinvigorate and modernize the cause? Hi, Evan. No, great question. Um, so the shared labs was a component uh, under Prop 71 that uh, we are also thinking about uh, as to how to uh, retool and re-implement 
uh, for the future. So uh, I anticipate that you will see uh, more discussion about how that might um, evolve and, and open up. So yes, that is, that is on, ongoing as well. Another familiar name, Alona Baum. Um, Alona says, what are requirements around California presence? Are there any changes since uh, the prior requirements? So there aren't any changes since uh, the issuance of our last uh, program announcement. So in terms of, of being California, if you were a California um, institution or entity uh, as, as defining the program announcement, you have the greatest flexibility in terms of the use of funds, which will allow you to use funds even uh, outside the state as with a clinical trial. Uh, if you are outside of California, you can apply to our clinical program, uh, but then we would only uh, allow CERM funds to be used for activities that occur in California. And so these are outlined in the uh, program announcement. So um, I encourage you to take a look at that. And again, if there are any questions, feel free to uh, contact us so that we can talk about it in more detail. Great. Um, the next one is from Eugenio Cingolani, who says, read the TRAN one's requirements for a single therapeutic candidate. Is it appropriate to propose to optimize formulations? Uh, let us say that the primary biologic has been chosen on the basis of extensive in vitro and small animal preclinicals, but the final formulation is not yet clear. Is a proposal comparing adjunctive factors and or different delivery vehicles in a large animal model within the scope? <clears throat> So generally, the, the, the identification and optimization of a final candidate is, is probably best suited for the discovery to opportunity um, so that all, those kinds of studies can be conducted within that um, uh, opportunity. And the TRAN-1 is basically taking your final candidate through translational activities that allow you to get to the pre-IND. So that might be a better fit for uh, DISC-2. Um, we're getting a number of questions about resubmissions. Um, this one is from Deborah Nguyen asking, how should we handle resubmissions from the previous program? So the applications currently have a uh, page that allow you to uh, address uh, any changes to your application uh, based on comments from reviewers or any changes that you made. So that becomes basically like a cover page within your proposal. So uh, the review panel will certainly look at that and acknowledge uh, resubmissions as part of the review. And so um, that, that is how we have generally structured those for the discovery and trend programs. For clinical, we have a process which if you um, get a score, the scoring is works a little differently. The scoring is based on a scale of a one, a two, or a three. And a one means that uh, it's recommended for funding. A two means that you need to make some improvements. And a three means not, not recommended. So those that get a score of two, essentially you get sort of a, a, a do-over. You get to, you don't have to reapply, but you are allowed to address reviewer concerns and make modifications to your existing application that the review panel will look at again and then come and give it a new score. So we've implemented that process in the clinical program. Otherwise, the applications themselves will have a section for you to address uh, any reviewer concerns from a previous review. Great. Um, Dan Kaufman wants to know, what are the plans for support of new uh, GMP cell and gene therapy manufacturing centers? Right, and thank you for your question. Yes, there, that is an important uh, area that uh, we want to develop, uh, but again, is it's a little too early to talk about. We, we have um, that uh, in our thoughts and something that will be part of uh, ongoing uh, discussion and strategic planning. Great. Um, next two questions are from uh, friends at USC. Ching Liu Michael asks, hang on a moment. 
that's just disappeared. Um, will Sirm von Tran or Clint studies using iPSCs to development uh, to develop small molecule or other types of therapeutics that is not a cell therapy nor directly acts on stem cells? Yes, again, you can use um, stem cells or iPSC cells as a tool that allow you to develop, uh, do small molecule screens or, um, or use them in other ways that can help you identify a candidate. Great, and the next is from Andy McMahon. Um, could you clarify how plans are tweaked and decisions on funding programs taken? Is this all at the board level or is active input and discussion being requested from the community? So, uh, let me make sure I understand how, how are plans tweaked and decisions on funding programs. So in general, um, we, we take these two concepts to the board. Um, so our, our normal process is to develop a concept for any of these. And, and the tweaks usually occur through just our, our experience and feedback um, from grantees, applicants, um, and uh, you know, to the extent that we can incorporate and adopt them, we do, and then we present them to, to the board in a public meeting where um, they are available for uh, you and others to comment on again. Um, so generally that is how uh, most of the major changes uh, to these are made. Great. Um, we're getting a lot of very similar questions here. So let me try and find one that touches on new ground. Uh, oh, Josh Stewart asks, will CIRM fund a data center again that coordinates across labs and creates an integrative resource? Uh, great question. Uh, I think that is something that we would certainly like to do in some way. Uh, we have not defined specifically how that might happen, but it is, uh, part of the ongoing strategic development that, uh, that we've been referencing. Great, um, let me see. So Amana Parast asks, uh, would CERN devote funds to research which has been hampered due to new restrictions on fetal tissue use by the federal government over the last few years? Um, so yes, we, we will fund, uh, uh, research that uses fetal tissue. Um, I, I don't know in terms of devoting funds specifically, but certainly any of our programs um, are available and open to funding um, research and projects that involve the use of, of fetal tissue. Um, Harley Kornblum asks, will applications in the different areas of emphasis such as neuroscience be placed in a separate pool? So uh, that's a good question. We, we don't know yet uh, for neuroscience specifically. In general, uh, we, we do not place uh, into a different pool uh, e each of the disease areas or areas of, of a scientific field. Um, of, for example, with the programs that we uh, are currently offering. Uh, but given that there is an emphasis and a call for uh, having uh, more within the area of neuroscience, uh, we may develop uh, some programs where we have a, a panel that is, is focused uh, on neuroscience in order to, to um, uh, address those. But at, at the moment, we, we do not. Um... Hannah Atamna asks, what's your advice to scientists who are new to the field? How about new ideas? New ideas are great. We love new <laughs> ideas. And um, that is what the inception program was intended uh, to do uh, when we first started it. And, and we really do want to think about how to stimulate uh, new ideas. And so that is uh, part of our strategic thinking in terms of what we can do uh, to do that. Um, but I, I will again just encourage you, if you have an idea um, and or have a project in mind that you think could fit within uh, one of these announcements that is open, uh, just reach out to our therapeutics team or our discovery and translation teams and uh, we can set up a, a, 
a phone meeting to talk uh, in more detail about the project and let you know how it may uh, uh, fit uh, within uh, that opportunity and probably also give you some guidance and advice as to how to uh, make a more competitive application. Um, so I have a doctor um, Utz from Stanford who is talking about CERN has been a leader in educating young people and nurturing their interest in stem cells with outstanding outcomes. Um, he's asking about some of the programs we've already talked about, about Bridges and Spark. And he says, also physician scientists are an endangered species, especially those like Tony Fauci, who only have an MD degree and not an MD and PhD degree. I would say that Tony Fauci has done quite well with just an MD degree. Um, does CERM plan to try to address this by offering research funding for medical students to work in CERM labs and for residents, fellows and junior faculty to launch their careers? Right, so that is also uh, an area that we're thinking about uh, within our educational and training programs. Um, in the past, our training program incorporated the support of clinical fellows, uh, but we uh, may wanna think of this uh, a little more broadly and in different settings and maybe uh, uh, how we might better be able to support uh, training for uh, whether it's medical students, uh, residents, fellows, uh, or physicians. Uh, so it is part of our uh, ongoing uh, strategic thinking. Great. I actually have a comment here from Jared Roach, and he says, one piece of advice to new applicants is to ask previously successful applicants if they would be willing to share successful applications with you. It helps to see, to see style and formatting. I think that's a great idea. Um, Martin Marsala asks, any plans to fund large animal core facilities for translational research with focus on both cell and gene therapies? Uh, so currently we, we don't have any plans, but that uh, again is, is something that we will, will discuss uh, as part of our strategic thinking. Okay. Um, we have a few questions left in the time we have available. Uh, let's see. Uh, Stephen Howell asks, do non-GLP IND enabling studies belong in DISC2 or TRAN1? So, uh, sorry, I, I'm not seeing that question. Stephen Howell. Repeat it again? Yeah. Do non-GLP IND enabling studies belong in DISC2 or TRAN1? That's towards the bottom of the, uh, the Q&A file, Gil. Okay, thank you. Um, so it, it, it might it might depend on on the specific studies. I would suggest that that's a good question for our um, translation team, um, and so I think that that might be a good follow up with them. Right. Um, I think we've covered most of the questions that were asked. We're getting multiple questions covering the same ground. Let me see if we have any others from yesterday. Here's a, here's a comment from Dinesh Rao, who is um, at UCLA, and he says, as a physician scientist and someone who's benefited from prior CERM support, I'd really like to encourage CERM to support the entire range of scientific endeavors, from normal to disease stem cells and not place limits on the science. Uh, basic science advances in stem cell research are a remarkable opportunity at the moment, and uh, with the convergence of technologies from gene editing, editing to multi-omics analyses, to a range of biochemical and biophysical technologies and computational biology. Uh, this is something that we've been hearing, uh, particularly towards the end of our first iteration, that we weren't supporting basic research and discovery research and translational research even. Um, so Gil, do you want to kind of talk about that, and what we're doing going forward? Um, so, so going forward, um, you know, right now, I, I think as mentioned, our, our plan is for the first six months to have these um, um, programs that are open, but even these are, are probably going to still undergo some modifications and changes to uh, better align them with our strategic thinking. And as we um, uh, go from there, I think the hope is to open up more programs in, in the basic arena to enhance our education programs, uh, address infrastructure, um, and um, all of these different elements. So a lot of this is, is something that's gonna be 
part of board discussion. And so if you have uh, comments or suggestions, that may be a place um, where you may want to uh, contribute public comment or suggestions uh, to, uh, to that discussion. Um, Randall Berg asks, what will be the mechanism for the stem cell research community to provide input into some strategic planning process? Um, right now, that's a little complicated because we're still in the process of kind of putting these plans together, trying to figure out um, how to implement the requirements of Prop 14. One of the issues we are discussing is something that we did when we issued our last strategic plan, before we issued our last strategic plan, which was to do a roadshow and talk to the various communities, institutions, companies, and researchers around California as to the things that they thought were important and the issues they would like to raise. Um, obviously, we can't do a physical roadshow right now because of the pandemic, but I know there's a discussion about having a virtual roadshow um, to invite, uh, to explain what we're trying to do, but also to invite your thoughts and ideas and suggestions. And so look out for that. That may be something that's coming up in the hopefully not too distant future. Um, And I think that's pretty much it. A lot of the questions, as I said, are kind of covering very similar ground. And um, rather than exhaust you even more, Gil, thank you for being so patient with, with uh, my stumbling questions. But um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to email me through info at CERM. Uh, .ca.gov. And what we'll do is we'll put together written answers to any of the questions we didn't manage to get to today, and maybe even some of the ones we did get to today, the ones that are getting a lot of kind of uh, reiteration, resubmission from many people, because clearly those are the issues that matter most to you. Um, we're open to any ideas, any thoughts. The idea behind this was to begin an, to kind of a conversation to help explain what we're doing so far, but also to explain that there's lots of things that we haven't quite figured out yet. We're thinking about them, but we still have a lot of planning to do. And so with that, I'd like to thank uh, Gil for, for being so patient and so knowledgeable. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all of you who joined in. Again, this was gonna be posted on our YouTube channel, uh, probably later today or early tomorrow. So if you or a colleague didn't manage to see all of it, um, you'll be able to find it there. Um, and then otherwise look out for a blog coming in the not too distant future, explaining, answering some of the questions that we haven't been able to answer today. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all and say happy new year and good luck for the future.